something. The devil cannot stop. Say, do something. And let me know that you're on my side. Come on, give God a great big hand. Oh, my God, my God, my God, my God. Right there, that was for somebody. That was, I don't know who it was for, but that was for somebody. You need God to do something. Oh, I don't know who that is. But you need, the Spirit is telling me to say it again. You need God to do something that man cannot do. Don't you thank God for serving a God who can do what man cannot do? And here's the other thing before you be seated. Here's the other thing. I thank God that we serve a God that man cannot stop. They can put whatever they want on the billboards. They can put whatever they want in the law. They can write whatever they want in the bill. They can tell the Senate to do whatever, but they cannot stop God. Hey. Oh my God. Hey, let me tell you. Do you remember, some of you have seen the movie Titanic, and some of you may have been around for Titanic, but nevertheless, when the movie came out, the captain of that ship said, even God cannot sink this vessel. You know, that's a dangerous thing. Never tell God what he cannot do. They said even God, the captain said, God cannot sink this vessel. Somebody say in short time. The Titanic was on the bottom of the ocean. Somebody say, but God. <laughs> come on, give him one more hand clap. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Woo, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Oh, my God, I need him to do something that man cannot do. That man, I normally don't have these tissues up here, but I'm a little afraid because of what I'm preaching today. So I, I've got a little, little backup. This is, some, this is backup. Amen. Somebody say backup. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Amen. The Lord is so good and his mercy endures forever. If you're glad to be in the house of the Lord today, say yes. yes. Oh, yes, I'm so glad to be in the presence of the Lord. I'm glad to be home in the name of Jesus. I'll tell you about that in a moment. I want to give God honor to those of you who are joining us online at Harvest Church of Hampton. Welcome. I want to thank Sister Linda for giving a shout out to my father in San Antonio, Texas. Yeah. Amen. I love my father. Amen. And my mother and father were uh, just wonderful. And I always say my, my father taught me how to be a man, and my mother taught me how to be a person. Amen. Come on, somebody. Well. And so when I, when I tell you I'm going to be somewhere, I'm, I'm there at that time. In fact, Brother, Brother Van, we're there early. Come on, somebody. I went to breakfast with Brother Van recently, and then uh, uh, I looked at my clock, and it was 10 minutes before the time we were supposed to meet, and I thought to myself, he's already there. Let me get going. <laughs> amen. Amen. Thank God for military brothers. Amen. So I give God glory, give God honor. I want to thank God for you being here. And if you're a first-time guest or if you are a return guest or if you are just visiting and you're not a member, I want to tell you we're so glad you're here. Yeah. Amen. We're so glad you are here with the Harvest family. We love the Lord. Amen. We want to love God and we want to love people. Amen. Yeah. I thank God for my friend right here. Amen. God bless you, brother. It's good to see you. Good to see. The Lord's got a word for you today. I want to tell you, when I was standing there, the Spirit told me to give you a word, okay? So, so Sister Tanya, don't let me forget to give my brother his word, amen? Praise the Lord. <clears throat> well, today, saints of God, we are going to um, get right into the word of God. I do want to thank the Lord for our praise and worship team, though. I do. Our worship team, our worship team, our worship team. <clears throat> Can I say this about the worship team? They have been such a blessing. Yes. Just as time has gone on, the Lord has anointed them more and more and more. And I've noticed that over the years of ministry that something happens in ministry and it's called evolution. And in evolution, well, now I don't believe in you know, natural evolution, but I do believe that you should evolve uh, with the times. And, and you know, if they were using uh, yellow pages and white pages, but now they're using Google, you need to transition Come on, somebody. 
Okay, okay, maybe you don't want to transition. You need to transition over to Google. And, 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 if, and, and now that we have Waze and Google Maps and, and, and the other maps, Apple Maps, um, you don't need a big white piece of paper with a bunch of lines on it. Now, it may be good to have a little almanac in the shelf or something, you, and you may want to do that, but I want to tell you there's a computer at every public library. You can find where you need to go. And so I just want to encourage you that even with the house of God, some things begin to evolve. There was a time when we only had a choir. Amen. And I love the choir. And we may go back to maybe have a, a choir once a month. Or, or, you know, we may go back to doing that because we don't want to throw out the baby and the bathwater. I love the choir now. I love the, the choir. But when COVID took place, it forced us to transition. How many of you know God will allow things to come into your life that will force you to do what? Oh, yes, he will. It'll force you to transition. So we transitioned to a worship team, not because we just only wanted two or three people singing, but because we only had two or three people to sing. So we went from a choir to a what? worship team and we and so now we were up to the times the lord made it happen amen but i want to tell you that since we've done that god has blessed and he has anointed and but here's a here is a difference in the choir and the worship team the choir anybody can sing so say amen because you can hide you know you don't even have just as long as you don't sing near a mic you're good because that was me i stood in the back corner to the left and i just just did that but the worship team we need skilled I mean skilled I mean skilled singers because you can hear every jot and tittle when you use those microphones and if you listen to it online we can really hear you amen and so uh, I just want you to know that as the worship team continues to expand we may even go to multiple worship teams and one team sing, sings on second and fourth Sunday one team sings on first and third Sunday then we may have the choir sing on the fifth Sunday it's called evolution somebody say evolution, evolution. and so I just want to encourage you that uh, we're not being sticklers but everything we do at harvest we want to do with the spirit of excellence because the Bible says that when the Hebrew boys, this is not my sermon, by the way, but the Bible says that when the three Hebrew boys, Misha, uh, 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 Han, no, 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 the, the, those are their slave names, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, the Bible says that when they, uh, uh, um, when they were presented before the king, it says they were not just as good as the other princes, they were ten times better. Is there any, come on somebody, is there anybody in the church that won't show church to be that's a whole nother sermon for a whole nother day in Jesus name so I want to encourage you God is blessing and he is growing and I want you to be a part of that thing amen and if you are hiding your gift I don't know maybe you used to be a R&B singer and you sing in the world and do the wop wop don't sit back in the left hand corner and hide your gift under a bushel. Come on up, brother. Come on up, sister. We really need some, 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 some strong, and I mean strong, solo-type brothers who can really blow, amen. But, but you, know, it's, you know, it's got a you know, spirit of excellence. I mean like the tip-top. Because the Lord is taking us somewhere. You want to go? Yes. Say, yes, I do. Yes. I do. I want to go. I want to go. God is so good. His mercy endures forever. Do you mind, do you mind um, going with me today? I'm going to get right into this Bible. Let's go. Ecclesiastes, the ninth chapter. We're going to start there. Ecclesiastes, the ninth chapter and the tenth and eleventh verse. Can you stand if you're able to? And we're going to read the word of God. Ecclesiastes, the ninth chapter and the tenth and eleventh verses. Thank you so much. Amen. So good to see you, Minister Brenda Green. Amen. And Injene, good to see you too. God bless you. If you're in Ecclesiastes, the ninth chapter and the tenth verse, please signify by saying amen. 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 <clears throat> the Bible reads, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom, 
in the grave whether thou goest. In other words, whatever you do, do it with everything you've got because you cannot do anything when you die. Amen. Amen. Verse 11. <clears throat> I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift. Oh, come on, somebody. Amen. Nor the battle to the strong. Neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. The Bible says the, that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. Can I speak to you for a couple of minutes from the subject, the race is not given to the swift. The race is not given to to the swift. Let's bow our heads briefly. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless your name for your word. We bless your name for your people. Everyone under the sound of my voice today, Lord, we belong to you in one way or another. Use us. Use me today to deliver your word, untainted and untethered. We give you glory for your work, we give you glory for your miracles, and we give you honor for all that you're going to do. In the name of Jesus, let the church say amen. amen. Come on, give God a great big hand as you take your seats. Glory to God. Amen. How many of you know, how many of you know <clears throat> that uh, recently Harvest Church started a cycling club called Bike and Brunch? Raise your hand if you just know that. You don't have to have gone on it, but just raise your hand if you know it. You know it. All right. If you've enjoyed it, now you can clap. If you've enjoyed Bike and Brunch, yeah, some of us, oh, yes, 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 some of, some of us have been coming out, and some days we would have 20 to 24 people, 25 people out on bicycles. There you have it. Out on bicycles, uh, just enjoying the fresh air. Amen. And even the e-bikers, even the e-bikers in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Well, uh, as a result of that, I was on a prayer call. We have a men's group, and the men's group, ha we have participants from all over the United States, nationwide. And I always tell the men on the men's group that our prayer call is a representation of heaven. In other words, there's such diversity on the prayer call, we, we have Jamaicans from New York. We have uh, Filipinos from New Jersey. We have uh, Irish white guys from uh, Iowa. We, we've got uh, 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 people from Texas uh, and all over. People call in from Montana. We've had people call in from overseas. So it is a, a conglomerate of the children of God. Amen. One of the brothers is from Iowa on our prayer call, and uh, he told us that there was a, a cycling event taking place in Iowa, that is an annual event uh, where 30,000, somebody say 30,000, 30,000 cyclists um, descend on the state of Iowa and ride from one side of Iowa to the other side of Iowa, approximately 450 miles in a period of seven days. Say, oh my God. <laughs> Some of you are looking at me the way my daughter looked at me when I told her about this event. And she said, uh, why would anyone <laughs> want to ride their bicycle across Iowa? Amen. All right. Uh, but one of, the, one of the main reasons that I, I thought that that would be a good idea. <laughs> you said, Pastor, you did. I can hear Sister Dobie right now. Sister Dobie, like, Pastor... We don't do that. <laughs> Can I encourage you not to allow your culture to limit you? Can I encourage you never to allow your friends to limit you? Can, can I encourage you that sometimes the blessing is outside of your circle? One thing I thank my father for, let me, let me give my father a little, little, some flowers. One thing I thank my father for is that even when we weren't invited to golf courses, he used to take me to golf courses. And I remember being the only young little black boy out there on the golf course while everybody else was hitting balls, watching my father act like he owned the course. <laughs> Come on, somebody. 
I remember my father taking us and putting us in tennis lessons. I, I remember him taking us bowling. We did all types of things that our culture didn't typically do. I remember learning to swim at a very early age and being the only little boy in that pool trying to get to the other side drinking too much of the pool water. But to this day, I thank God because it's allowed me to be a little more well-rounded and it has allowed me to be a little bit like Paul in that I can be all things. Come on. To all men. Come on now. Come on now. Come on now. You want to get outside of your group because sometimes your group doesn't want to hear what you have to say. Amen. All right. So one of the reasons that I thought it might be a decent idea for some of the brothers to get together and go to Iowa and participate <laughs> in this event uh, was because um, I wanted us to be able to fellowship with some of the men from our prayer call, and, uh, and I thought it would be an excellent opportunity for evangelical ministry. Where else are you going to find a captive audience of 30,000 men and women who are all there for the same purpose and will be there for seven days and almost have to listen to what you have to say? <laughs> So that's why I thought it was a good, uh, a good reason to go. And, and I will tell you that um, I did not ride across Iowa, okay? I wasn't crazy enough to do that, amen, that my body said no. Amen. My body, anybody else, you got a body that will tell you no? And sometimes you need one. Amen. And so I did not ride across Iowa. Um, we, I, I, I participated in just a portion. In fact, um, I, you know, I don't want you to look at me uh, as if I'm special. Uh, I... I did, I rode at a pace called, um, when I get there, I get there. Amen. That was my pace, okay. And I want to tell you that I was the one walking the bike up the hill and rolling down the other side <laughs> of the hill. That was right, yes, that was me. That, that, that's what I did, that's what I did. Um, because it wasn't about um, winning. It wasn't about winning. The, the event was less about the physical accomplishment, and it was really more about the experience that I was going to have with some of the brothers that we were going to be able to fellowship with. Um, it ended up that I was only able to be there with one of the men from our prayer call, and his name is Fred. His name is Fred. Already you know. His name is Fred. That's Fred right there. That's Fred. Fred is, 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 is a 75-year-old CPA and professor, college, co college professor. He's an academic but he loves the Lord. Amen. Amen. And he's a Lutheran brother. This is one thing I love. Yeah, that's right. You have to step outside of the four walls of your little de denomination and you've got to get to know some folks. Amen. amen. Come on, somebody. Say amen. 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 That's what, uh, that, that, uh, let me step out for a second. That's why when I went to uh, Kenya to do ministry, the, the, the ministry in Kenya, in Nairobi, was completely different than what we do in the United States. And I was more blessed in their services than many of our services because great faith and power come when, you, uh, when, when all you have is God, when all you have is God. So, so surprisingly, um, what I learned when I was there, I just want to share a couple things with you because what I learned when I was there, it surprised me. It really did. I thought we were going to be able to just, uh, you know, minister to a couple of people, hand out some, some um, ministry cards and and just kind of go on about our business. But um, we all have to come to a place in our spiritual walk where the Spirit is able to instruct us and bless us in every experience, especially your most uncommon experiences. Amen. Don't always complain when it gets uncomfortable. It could be God trying to bless you. Okay, all right. So somebody say the race is not given to the swift. All right. So let me give you point number one. If you're taking notes, do me a favor, write this down. The first thing I learned when I was in Iowa, the first thing I learned while riding is that you have to start with the end in mind. You have to start with the end in mind. Now, one thing you have to know about this particular race, it's actually called ragbri. It's an annual race that's been taking place for over 50 years. But one thing you have to know about it is <clears throat> it's not the, a typical race in the sense that there is one winner. Right? It, it's, there, there's, there's not just one winner. Anybody who finishes the race is a winner. Okay? And so it's a lot like our Christian race. Anybody who finishes the race 
come on somebody, is a winner. It doesn't matter whether you get there first or whether I get there first. In fact, you go ahead and get there first. I'll wait for Jesus to come. But uh, anybody who finishes the race is a what? Is a winner. Everyone who is found in Christ when Jesus returns is a winner. Everyone who is found in Christ when their time on earth is done is a what? Is a winner. I want, you to, I want you to know everyone who beats him in the air, who's caught up to meet him in the air when he comes back on the cloud, they're called a winner. Look at somebody and say, it pays to be a winner. It pays to be a winner. Tell them, say, it pays to be a winner. But you have to start with the end in mind. Let me tell you why. If you start with the end in mind, in other words, if you know your destination... If, if you know where you're going, did you know the problem with too many people in the world is that they just don't know where they're going? The problem with too many young people, too many high schoolers, too many college students, too many uh, people who are 18 to 30 years old is that they, they have, they're, they're talented, they're, they're highly intelligent, they're uh, unbelievably skilled in the technological field, but some of them just don't know what? where they're going. The reason I went, to the, I went to a military school and the reason I went to a military school directly out of high school was because I had no idea where I wanted to go. But Brother Joseph, when I arrived on that school, that, they called it a yard, they didn't call it a campus. When I arrived on the yard and they put that military uniform on me and cut off all my hair, I knew where I was going. First, I was going to the barber shop. Next, I was going to do some push-ups. I already knew my direction, and I knew that in four years, I'd be a military officer. It put me in a direction. You need to know where you're going. You need to know where you're going. And so uh, 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 I've always found that it's hard to get to any destination when you don't know where you're going. Have you ever gotten in a car with somebody and they say, come on, we're going. And you say, well, where are we going? They say, oh, just get in. We're going to start riding. I don't get in those cars. You don't, you're not taking, no, you know, no. <laughs> Tell me where we're going. Amen. And because when you know where you're going, you can prepare for the trip. <laughs> See, when you know where you're going, you know that when you go to work, you're not just going to work. You're going to build generational wealth for your children and your children's children. Come on, somebody. You need to know where you're going. You're not just going to work. Somebody say, I'm not just going to work. We have to stop just working from paycheck to paycheck. Know where you're going. Are you going to church on Sunday or are you going to prepare yourself to receive an immortal body when Jesus comes? Listen, when you know where you're going, it, it makes the job so much easier. Listen, when you start with the end in mind, when you know your destination, when you know where you're going, listen to me very carefully, all of the things that happen from the start of the race to the end of the race become less debilitating. Let, let, let me explain what I'm talking about. Let me tell you something. If I told you that at 12 midnight... I would have $1 million waiting in my front yard for you. As long as you made it until 12 what? Yeah. See, already you remembered how to get the million. And, 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 and then let's say you leave church and you go to Walmart and the lady at Walmart is very mean to you at the cash register. You know what you'd say to yourself? That's all right. I got a million dollars waiting for me at midnight. And then you go down the street and, you, and somebody swerves out in front of you and cuts you off. You have to slam on, uh, slam on the brakes instead of going, you little. You know what you would say? Whew, you almost stopped me from getting my million. And then your little girlfriend, she comes your way. She says, honey, she says, you, you, you know, you don't look like you're going anywhere. I'm going to break up with you. It's okay. I, I, I think we need to go our separate ways. Uh, I, need some, I need a moment. You know what you would say to yourself? Your loss. Because I'm getting a million dollars at what? When you know where you're going, the things that happen between the start and the finish of the race become less debilitating. It doesn't mean you don't go through what you go through. It doesn't mean that she didn't break your heart. It doesn't mean that he didn't rip your, 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 your emotions out. 
but it means that you can make it because you know what lies at the end. Come on, somebody say, lift your right hand and say, I need a million. <laughs> That's why the Bible says that when you live this life, you have to look unto Jesus. Because he's the author and finisher of our faith. Then it says the reason he was able to do what he was able to do and endure what he was able to, to endure is because it says who uh, 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 endured the cross. He said because of what was set before him. It says for the joy that was set before him, he was able to endure the cross. He was able to despise the shame. In other words, when you have a joy, when you have a destination, when you have a place you're going, you can endure the cross and you can despise the shame. You can put up with the humiliation. You can put up with being broke for a little while. You can put up with struggling for a little while. You can put up with a little foolishness because you've got a destination. Some of you just need to know where you're going. Come on, say amen. Oh, my God. Listen, I remember all the disappointments in my life and all of the challenges. See, the problem is you and I, we look at people where they are now. We don't look at where they've been. Everybody wants the end product, but nobody wants the process. Everybody wants to be on top, but nobody wants to start on the bottom. We all want to take the elevator. Nobody wants to take the, nobody wants to take the stairs. But let me tell you something. If you want to be something in God, you're going to have to start from the bottom. Do you know that when the Lord first saved me, I was an usher. That was my first job. I was an usher. That's what we call them in, you know, in our church, the usher. I was an usher. And I stood on that door. I couldn't stand ushering, by the way. I could just, <laughs> my knees would hurt so bad. My back would hurt. You'd stand up for the whole service and them long with the pre- lemon. That's a whole other story. <laughs> I've been an usher. I've been a musician. I've, been, I've done everything. I've been a head trustee. I've been the minister of music. I've been a choir director. I've done it all. You know why? Because I had a destination. Wasn't doing it for a title. Wasn't doing it for a pat on the back. Why are you doing what you're doing? Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. See, problems can be, deb- let me move on, but the problems can be debilitating. But, but when you know where you're going and when you know why you're going, somebody say Why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, sometimes the why can be more important than the where. (laughs) The Bible says in Romans, the 8th chapter and the 18th verse, it says, For the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. In other words, when you know your why, you can put up with the when and where. Right? So some of us, we just need to know that if we start with the end in mind, we'll know our where and we'll know our why because heaven is in our view. All right? That's what we have to have. We have to have heaven in our view. Let me tell you the second point. The second point today is this. Life, and this one, this is the one I might need some tissues on. Life is not meant to be done alone. It's just not. Life is not meant to be done alone. Do you know that when Jesus sent the disciples out, he did not send them out alone. He sent them out two by two. two. He sent James and John out together. He sent Andrew and Peter out. Then we find that Paul went with Silas, and then Paul went with uh, Barnabas, and then Paul went with Timothy. You know, one thing I like about Paul is he could change, he could, it's called pivoting. He could pivot in a moment. You have to come to a place in your life where you learn to pivot in a moment because friends will change on you. Relationships will change on you. Jobs and careers will change on you. You have to learn to pivot in a moment. Paul, he was so good at it, he was a quick pivot. He said, okay, Barnabas, you got upset with me because I wouldn't let your nephew come on the last missionary journey? He said, peace in the Middle East. 
He said, come on, Silas, we're on the road, brother, we're on the road. And then Silas went on to do a little more ministry. He said, okay, well, now I'm going this way. He said, Timothy, hey, tell your grandmother I need you. You have to learn to pivot when people want to go in another die, in another direction. Now, I'm not telling you to give up on a good relationship. I'm not telling you to walk out on a marriage. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about these so-called friends we have. These, These whimsical friends. The ones that are there when the times are going well, but they're nowhere to be found when you're going through. Don't raise your hand, but I wonder how many of us have ever had a friend you couldn't find when times got hard. Mm, 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 mm. Life is not meant to be done alone. But I want you to remember this. Who you do life with makes a big difference. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 my question today for you is who are you doing life with? Who, who are you doing life with? Who are you communing with? Who are you fellowshipping with? Who are you going to the movies with? Who are you hanging out with? Who are you, who are you doing life with? Because it makes a big difference. Difference. One of the things I learned when I was on this ride, and I'll explain this to you, I was on this long road. You see that road? I was on this long road. These roads in Iowa, I think the devil made them. <laughs> By the way, one thing I do like that the, 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 the audio video team did today, you, you probably missed it, but I'm the pastor, I noticed it. I noticed that when they sang, this means war, and the, and the song said, uh, the devil's on my track, something like that. No, it says Satan's on my track, trail, something. You can tell I'm not a worship team leader. They kept Satan lowercase. They kept the S on Satan lowercase. You know why? That's just what he deserves. Uh, you got to learn to put the devil under your feet. Stop capitalizing Satan's name. <laughs> Amen. Oh, good, good. Let grandma go out the window when it comes to that. Amen. But I was on this long road in Iowa. Oh my God, these roads in Iowa Saints. I had never seen so much corn. I have never, I've never seen so much corn. So one of the brothers, Fred, lives in Iowa. And so I got back to his house one day and, uh, and he's like, well, how did you enjoy X, Y, and Z? I said, well, you know, it's interesting. I've been here all this time. I haven't seen any corn. But I was kidding. But you should have seen the look of bewilderment on his face. He was like, you didn't see any corn. I was like, yeah, I saw some corn. All I saw was corn. I mean, it was a lot of corn. It was a lot of, lot of corn. So I'm on this long road. I'm on this long road. And it's amazing when you're on these long, hot, never-ending roads in the middle of nowhere in the state of Iowa. Because there were times, it was crazy, there were times when I felt like I was Moses in the middle of the desert. There there were times when I felt like Abraham and and God had said, go into a land that I won't show you. I'm telling you, I was out there in the middle of nowhere. Let me explain. So the second day, each day, uh, the, the race goes a particular length. Okay, so I won't even tell you the numbers because you just, you just, you'll fall out your chair. So one day might be 100, mile, 100 miles of riding. Another day might be 60 miles. Another day might be 70. <laughs> Look at Sister Lowe's face. Another day might be 70, so on and so forth. Well, this particular day was a pretty long day, and, uh, and I got a late start. So what you need to know is, is that typically when you have a long day of riding, you're going to leave before the sun comes up so that you can beat the heat. Uh, uh, because last year it was over 100 degrees. This year the Lord blessed us, and it was only 83. And so uh, they leave between 6 o'clock and 8 o'clock in the morning. I didn't leave until 10 a.m. So the bus had left. But I didn't really know that, so I got there and I started riding. And there were a few stragglers, you know, you know, you know, some stragglers. And so I ended up riding alone for about two hours. Alone. Life's not meant to be done how? Not meant to be done alone. I I, I want, the, the, the point that the Lord showed me is that if you can avoid it, never ride alone. 
Look at somebody and tell them, say, never ride alone. Never, never tell them, say, never ride alone. You, you don't have to do that. Never ride alone. I'm out there all by myself. The, the reason you need not to ride alone is because you need a ride and die. You, you, you do. You, you need a partner. You, you need a, a, a friend. You, you need somebody who will stay with you through thick and thin because the Bible says a threefold cord is not easily broken because two can do more than one. Amen. And so, um, so after about two hours of, of walking up the hill and rolling down the other side, I came across a gentleman um, who was walking his bike. He was an older man, and his name was Paul. And I, I see Paul, and, and, and he looks like he might be in distress. So I, um, I know I look jacked up. Don't, don't, don't. Hey, no, this is a judgment-free zone in here, okay? Don't come to me after service saying, you look like a hip. I know what I look like. And, uh, and so, uh, so I see Paul, and he's walking up the hill, and I said to myself, I said, well, uh, he looks like he's uh, not doing well. I better walk with him. And, but really, the, the underlying motive was that I was tired. And so I started walking with him, asking if he was okay. And, and it turned out that when I connected with this 66-year-old physician from Omaha, Nebraska, that brother gave me so much strength. He encouraged me. He talked to me. He helped. He said, I've done Brad, Rag Bri 24 times. I said, oh, my God, I'm with you, brother. I'm with you. And he began to, to, to move. And the thing I loved about him was he moved at my pace. You know, the get there when you get there pace. And he, he walked up the hill and rolled down the other side of the hill. Whenever we get there, we get there. But how many of you know sometimes you need somebody to walk with you that will go at your pace? Sometimes you need somebody that will walk with you that doesn't go too fast, and, but they also don't go too slow. You need somebody who's going to walk with you because the race is not given to the swift nor the battle to the strong. You need somebody. Somebody say, I need somebody. I know you do. You need somebody. The other reason that life is not meant to be done alone is because you need somebody who's going to help you stop and smell the roses. Some of you are working constantly, going nonstop, day after day after day. You look up, it's 2024. You look up, it's 2025. You're going to look up, it's going to be 2030. And before you know it, you will not have done anything for yourself, gone anywhere for yourself. You wouldn't even have gone to Hawaii, Isaac. Had you not taken time for yourself. This young man, he just graduated from high school and had the sense enough to go to Hawaii. Come on, somebody. Because he knows for the next four years, he and TJ at Spelman College, they, not Spelman, Morehouse, sorry. Spelman is, the, I know, I know, brother. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. They're going to Morehouse. He knows for the next four years, he's going to be working. He's going to be working. Amen. And so you, you, if you keep going and going and you never have somebody to help you stop and smell the roses, you, you, you'll rush through life. You'll look up and you will not have taken any time for yourself. And then you'll have three, four, five kids and you will have never taken a vacation. Won't even know what the other side of Philadelphia looks like. And then you'll be proud of it. I've never left Virginia. Man, what's wrong with you? You shouldn't be proud of that. You can, you can jog to the other side of Virginia and get to North Carolina. <laughs> but Paul, <coughs> Paul made me walk through the fields. He was moving really slow. He made me walk through the fields. He made me walk, go get some lemonade slushies. Paul had me go down and sit down in the grass. He just said, oh, take your time. Dude, listen, God will send people into your life to help you stop. And smell the roses. One time I told my wife, I called her. She was at work. I said, listen, I said, uh, I said, we're going to South Africa. I said, you need to get some time off. She said, South Africa? She said, why would I want to go to South Africa? I said, oh, you're going to love it. You should go. I said, uh, uh, I said uh, she said, no. She said, why do you want to go to South Africa? And so I thought to myself, she has a husband trying to take her to South Africa. And she got the audacity to complain. So I told her, I said, my people are in South Africa. She told me, your people in Texas. <laughs> I said, you know, that's, you know, I said, that's not right. I said, well, then your people in South Africa. 
She said, my people in Louisiana. <laughs> I said, well, let me tell you something. I'm going to send you a postcard from South Africa. She said, how much time do I have? I said, you got 48 hours. <laughs> do you know where we went for two weeks? South Africa. Do you know what she said to me about 10 days in? She said, this is the best trip we've ever taken. I said, I know. <laughs> That's right, baby. You have to take some time to smell the roses. Let me tell you something. Work's going to be there on Monday. And if you leave it, you come back, that same work will be right on your desk. Take some time to smell the roses. You don't want to live life alone because you need to learn to appreciate the little things. The, 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 one of my favorite scriptures says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works toward the children of men. In other words, you need to pre appreciate the little things. So you need some Pauls in your life. Some people who will help you stop and do what? Smell the roses. So, so like that kind of man, he'll tell you to stop complaining about a car and, and just be happy you have one. Stop complaining about your job and just be happy you have one. Come on, somebody. So, so, so stop and smell the roses. Do that for me. Stop and smell the roses. God will send somebody into your life that is the most unlikely running mate. Who would have ever thought I would be sitting on a grass field in Iowa, Iowa, with a 66-year-old physician from Omaha, Nebraska, telling him about Jesus. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. And, and, and the Lord gave me opportunity to, uh, to, to, to invite so many people to our men's prayer group because that was the objective of the whole event was this ministry. And, and I, remember, I remember this, uh, just in terms of not walking alone, I remember, okay, where are my tissues? I remember one time I was in a... Um, going through a very difficult time in ministry. And the, the devil had a full court press going. He, he, um, he was fighting me from every side. I mean, from, with, uh -oh, from within and from without. I, and uh, I was talking to some of the brothers before service. And you know, church people can be some of the meanest people around. Amen. Amen. They got the big S. <laughs> Satan. And, and, uh, and I was going through a really difficult time, and I never, I've never, ever, ever thought about going back. I've never, I, I don't even know why people would leave God because of what man does. That doesn't even, that's like somebody else slapping you, but then you leaving your wife. What's wrong with you? Why leave God because of what man does? Amen. So I'm, I'm sitting in a sauna one day, and uh, <clears throat> I'm just uh, meditating, sweating and meditating. And this man walks in, this 70-year-old white Irish military chaplain walks in. His name was Charlie. And thank God for Charlie. And he sits on the front of me. <clears throat> and I didn't say anything to Charlie. And all of a sudden, Charlie says, Excuse me, do you mind if I give you a word from the Lord? Okay, so <clears throat> by this time, I had been so beaten, battered, and bruised by church people that I didn't even verbally respond. I just nodded my head in affirmation. And, and I'm going to tell you what he told me. I remember verbatim what he said to me. He said, the Lord says, pursue, and most assuredly, you shall recover all. And he said, and your latter state will be greater than your former state. Who Jesus. I need some more water. That's what I needed to hear. The man didn't know me. Sometimes the Lord will send people into your life to speak a word of deliverance 
when you need it most. That's what he'll do. I knew I shouldn't have given that point. <laughs> mm. I need some water, Brother Harold. <laughs> All right, let me give you the third point. <laughs> Somebody said, never walk alone. Never walk alone. The Bible says, oh, I'm good, sir. Come on. I appreciate you. <laughs> I appreciate you. See, Brother Darrell, that's going to make me cry more. No, no, no. Thank you. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. All right, let's close out. This, this, <laughs> point number three is this. Never miss your opportunity to be a blessing. That's what Brother Darren just did. Never miss your opportunity to be a blessing. <clears throat> oh, Lord, thank you. You have to know to what end you were born and for what cause you came into the world. Jesus said, to this end was I born, for this cause came I into the world. He said, I came to save my people from their sins. Jesus said, the reason I came is so that people could be saved from their sins. <clears throat> so each day of our, our race, our, and I'm sorry, the, the event, let's call it the event because I certainly wasn't racing. Um, each day um, we set a goal, Fred and I. Fred is the gentleman that I was visiting with, fellowshipping with. And each day we set a goal to see how many business cards we could hand out that would invite people to this uh, men's prayer group. And so we were challenging each other and seeing who could hand out the most cards, and I would say that we did well. Everybody we talked to, we began to hand out these cards, and, 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 and the cards that, that we gave out have QR codes on them. That's the card that we gave out. We had thousands and thousands printed, and we were just handing them out, and this QR code will take people directly to the Zoom prayer group. That happens every day at 12 o'clock. If you're here today and you're a brother, you don't have to be a member of Harvest. You don't, you don't even have to be saved. It does not matter. It is an opportunity for you to get a refreshing in the middle of the day and hear a word from the Lord and possibly get a miracle. So we were handing these cards out. And, if, and, and by the way, at the end of service, if you would like uh, to join this prayer call, just go to the welcome table. They've got these cards. Take a card, and all you have to do is, is you know, use the QR code. So we were handing these cards out, <clears throat> and every person we talked to, we were inviting to this prayer group, but what surprised me was Fred's zeal. Keep in mind, Fred is a 75-year-old CPA uh, uh, academic uh, from, I from Des Moines, Iowa, who, who I never would have met, else I had stepped outside of my little box, right? Fred was on fire. He was, everybody he talked to, he why don't you come to the prayer group? Why don't you come to the prayer group? Why don't you come to the prayer group? We, we talk about Jesus every day. He was handing out these cards. He was beating me. I was like, so I wouldn't tell people I was a pastor because he was working so good. So, so we were handing out these cards and he was being such a blessing. He wasn't missing his opportunity to be a blessing to people. I want to encourage you, never miss your opportunity to invite somebody to church. Even if you're not a member of that church, invite them to the church. Invite them to Harvest. You know it's a good church. Just go ahead and invite them. Amen. I've got friends who aren't even members of Harvest. They have sent 10 and 20 other people who have become members because they know it's a good church, but they're just not ready. Right? That's okay. Sometimes you just need some time to get what? Get ready. That's all right. So never miss your opportunity to invite somebody to church or to tell somebody about Jesus. Amen. So... Let me give you my last example. Uh, this happened to us uh, the last day, uh, and nothing like this has ever happened to me before in my life. I don't know if anybody's ever been this kind to me. I don't know. So Fred and I are riding, and um, Fred begins to get overheated. And he begins to become very red. And, and I've seen people who had heat exhaustion. Um, and, I, and, and so I was alarmed. So I, I told him, I said, hey, I think we need to get you to a care station. And, uh, 
And being a man, he was stubborn. And he said, no, nah, I'm okay, I'm okay. But it got to the point where um, I, I had to take control. And so I rode ahead of him about a half a mile. I found a state trooper and asked the state trooper to transport him to a safe place. So the state trooper said, well, well, will he go willingly? I said, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm stronger than him. We, we can make it happen. And uh, so, so the, the, the nearest safe place was too far. And so the, there was a home about a quarter of a mile up the road, uh, a beautiful home that was on the highway that we were riding on. And the family, this family, had set up a tent on the side of the road, and they were... Um, they were uh, giving people water, assisting people by giving them water, just helping them with whatever they needed, and they were spraying people down. So it was uh, 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 the man who owned the house, his name was Rick, the, the, the wife of the house, her name was Lou Ann. Then their daughter, Megan, was out there uh, helping, and the grandchildren, Cooper and Kylie, were out there handing out water bottles to all of the riders. When, uh, when Fred and I get to the station, I'm telling you these people treated me like I was their son. Now, just kind of read between the lines. I could understand them being kind to Fred. But they treated me like they had known me all my life. And the wife, Luann, she's like, she said, she said, oh, you need to come into the house so that we can cool off. And you need to charge your phone, Charles. You need to charge your phone. <laughs> And I kept, I kept declining. I said, oh, no, it's okay, so, 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 so. By the time the day ended, I was in the refrigerator. They were, <laughs> they were handing out snacks. I left there with a bag of goodies and a phone charger. I, it was, and they kept Fred. They, trans, they transported Fred to the next city. I, had, I was like Jesus. I have not seen so great faith in all Israel. Turned out they were Lutheran. They were a Christian couple, but they weren't out there preaching to anybody, but their actions spoke louder than their words. Listen, your actions should speak louder than your words. I don't know if I've ever been treated that kindly by complete strangers in my life, but it brought tears to my eyes. I got back to my hotel that night. I went straight to Target and bought them a car and wrote them this beautiful car. And, and that's one thing I know how to do. And I wrote them a beautiful car. I, I have never been treated that kindly, not by saints or sinner. Never miss your opportunity. Come on, everybody, let's stand. Never miss your opportunity to be a blessing to somebody. I thank God for Rick and Luann and Megan, their daughter, and Kylie and Cooper, the grandkids. Man, by the time I finished, I was walking out, and, and little Kylie, she was 10 years old, she was telling me, um, I wish you were here tomorrow. I'm going to my reading class, and I'm going, and I'm going to make sure I can do it. I was, she was just talking to me, and I was like, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. Never miss your opportunity to be a blessing to others. And can you do me a favor? Let's be like Rick and Luann and let's put aside titles and positions and, and social status and, and put aside skin color and culture and just be kind to people. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. Because the Bible says, whatever's in your hand to do, do it with all of your might. Do it with all of your soul. Because the race is not given to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. Now listen, as we're opening up the prayer line, the altar for prayer, I want you to remember that number one, you should start with the end in mind. Right? You need to know where you're going. You need to know, you, you want to make heaven your final destination. Because if you have heaven in your view, Everything that happens between the start and the finish will be less debilitating. And then I want you to remember that life has never, never, never been meant to be led alone. You're not supposed to live it alone. 
And maybe some of you are in here today and you're, you're, you have not given your life to Christ yet. But one of the problems is, is that you're, you're kind of living life all alone and you don't have anybody to meet you on that highway and help you who will go at your pace, not too fast and not too slow, but they will help you in your walk with Christ. And as we, when we open this altar up today, I want you to come and receive prayer, especially if you need to have Jesus hold your hand and walk with you. I know life can be hard. I know people can be mean. I know things can happen that, that are not fair. I understand that. But the Lord will be your friend that will stick closer than a brother. Yes, he will.